Good afternoon, everyone. How y'all doing? Yes. Was anybody here yesterday for our speaker? A couple of hands. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. A little energy, a little energy at the end of the day. So um, my name is Jeff Standish. Uh, I work here at the Institute of the Environment, and I'm real happy to welcome you all. It seems like we got a new group of uh, faces here for the most part. Welcome you to i &E for the fourth uh, effort in our Making Change speaker series. Um, I work in corporate sustainability here, and so um, I'm really excited about the group of uh, speakers that we've had lined up, lined up this semester, including our, our guest here today, Chris Clark from Excel. And uh, my colleague Tim will be introducing Chris in a moment, but I just had a few quick comments, especially uh, the first one, since many of you may not be familiar with our space. If you need a restroom, it's out to the atrium and to the right. So it was important information to make sure everybody's clear on. Uh, secondly, I want to say hello to everybody up in Duluth, uh, University of Minnesota Duluth. We're live streaming up there to some of our colleagues and students uh, on that campus. And I will rely on you, Dustin, if anybody has questions in the Q&A um, for you to transport those to us. Um, the Institute of the Environment, for those of you that don't know, is a hub of interdisciplinary research and activity here at the university. We work uh, in the research realms, discovery, uh, leadership development, and communication. And this speaker series is actually a perfect example of how we try to bridge those interdisciplinary um, spaces along with different audiences, our students, our graduate students and postdocs, and our external um, and research scientists as well. So thank you all for being here. I did want to say that um, this speaker series actually kind of cropped up organically. And while we're halfway through, and Tim and I were just talking this morning about generally it's been going really well, it doesn't actually matter what we think about how well this speaker series has been going. We want to hear from all of you, including from uh, Duluth folks. So whomever your connection point is here at INE, whether it's Professor Smith or myself uh, or anybody that you know here, please reach out and let us know um, how this has been, whether it's been a useful um, engagement for, for all of you. So with that, I want to turn it over to uh, Professor Tim Smith to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Jeff, and thank you all for, for taking time to, to be here today. Um, this is part of a, of a series that we, that we put on this uh, semester to try to maybe shed some light on um, things that people are doing in this space, um, whether it be around water or whether it be around energy, um, whether it be around broader corporate sustainability issues. Um, what we mainly wanted to bring was a bit of an organizational lens, how groups of people come together um, through whether they're for-profit or non-profit organizations, um, and how we can begin to shed, shed some light on strategies that these organizations are taking to make important strides um, towards transitions to a more sustainable future, whether that be around renewable energy or whether it be around energy storage or whether it be around the water issues we heard about yesterday. Um, so we are super lucky to have Chris Clark here, uh, the president of uh, Excel Energy for the Minnesota and Dakotas region, um, an, an Iowan uh, originally. We won't hold it against him, <laughs> at least not for the next hour. Uh, but um, really interesting work um, being done. Obviously, uh, with the insight he has across one of the, the really most forward-thinking utilities, I think, um, especially uh, in, in the U.S. in terms of many of their targets and approaches towards um, renewable integration. Um, a lot of really great insight around um, issues of automation that we talked about earlier. Um, and we're, we're super excited to help uh, maybe solidify some of the connections that he has with the University of Minnesota as his, his daughter is starting here as a freshman as, as well. So with that, I, I certainly won't, won't eat into any more time, but Chris, thank you so much for being here, and, and um, we look forward to your, your talk. Can you hear me now? No. There, you go. there we go. Okay. All right. Well, it's great to be here. I, am a, I did go to the University of Iowa, so I am a Hawkeye. Um, my son went to the University of Wisconsin. He's a Badger, but my daughter is saving the family. She's a gopher, so there you have it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. 
Uh, I like talking about what's going on in the energy industry, so I'll tell you a little bit about our company. Um, I did bring our sustainability brochure. They're back on the table there if you'd like some information. This is a total company view, and as you'll see from my presentation, uh, we actually serve eight states. Uh, we serve a very politically set of diverse states. Uh, North Dakota, Minnesota in particular, have not seen eye to eye on energy issues, and uh, we're the largest utility in both states. We're also the largest utility uh, in South Dakota um, by most measures. We don't have the land, but we have the people and the load, um, the, the customers using our energy. Um, so we get to navigate that political mix, and uh, we've tried to do it in a, a manner that is uh, uh, bipartisan and has appeal across the aisle. Well, why do I say that? Well, because we all voted today, or we're going to vote today. Anyway, I can't find my, my sticker. It fell off. But, uh, um, but it is important, we think, as we navigate this transition to really have a message that, that resonates uh, across the aisle. So let me tell you a little bit about us. Um, this is just a little bit of the scope. We are one of the larger uh, investor-owned utility companies. We serve electric and gas. We have a little bit of steam in, in our Denver system. Um, fairly sizable, um, financially um, over 11,000 employees. Uh, that does include some of our contractors. Uh, because of the seasonal nature of utilities, we do have a lot of contractors. Over 17,000 megawatts, that's really our unit of measurement. Um, we do serve natural gas, uh, which presents some interesting issues as we look at, uh, in particular, the shift and the focus on uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, natural gas has, for electric generation, about half the uh, carbon output of coal, but we all, most, for the most part, use it to heat our homes. And so as we think about what the long run transition is, uh, there's some interesting debate about whether there's a future for natural gas and what that future is. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have quite a few um, electric customers. So just to give you a sense of where we serve in the Midwest, um, we go over into Wisconsin. Uh, we go down to La Crosse and up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And then we go uh, down to Sioux Falls and into South Dakota. We serve uh, Fargo, Grand Forks, and then out to Minot. Um, there's co-ops in the mix in there, uh, but Minot is... Why not go to Minot and see what's going on? Uh, sort of the farthest west until you uh, go to our other systems in Colorado and then uh, Texas and New Mexico. Uh, so as a company, we've set out three strategic priorities, and this is relevant to really what we're doing on sustainability uh, because it's been the leadership uh, from our CEO and our previous CEO that's really set us on this path. Um, most recently, we've transition to these three messages. We want to lead the clean energy transition, and there really is a, a big transition happening in the energy is, in the industry right now. Uh, we've tried to embrace that. We're the number one wind provider uh, for 12 out of the last 13 years. Uh, my friends at MidAmerican, which is a, uh, headquartered in Des Moines, uh, stole that title from us. We're going to steal it back by adding a bunch more wind to our system, but a good healthy competition. Uh, we're also having the opportunity to add quite a bit of solar to our system, uh, and there's a lot of new technology, batteries, and other things coming. And of course, the transition does include moving away from coal in particular, uh, and then a big debate about the relevance of uh, whether to have natural gas uh, as part of that generating mix, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Uh, we want to enhance the customer experience, and that's really because um, more and more people are, are living the life on their gadgets and their iPhones, and um, having customer service experiences from Amazon and others, and that gives us the opportunity to look at where we can incorporate technology into our business. Um, and that's simple things like uh, having an outage app so that if your lights go out, you can go onto your phone and you can see what our estimated time is for the trucks coming and uh, restoring the breaker and getting power back on, uh, how many customers are out, information that, that tends to tell you uh, why the power is out. Um, but we're also looking at places where we can incorporate technology to make the system much more efficient. And we're in an interesting business because the state actually encourages us to ask you not to use our product, which is not your typical business model. 
Um, but we work with our customers to help them use uh, energy much more efficiently. LED lighting has been a huge uh, shift in uh, customer efficiency along with um, appliance efficiency. Uh, and then in your larger companies, commercial and, and manufacturing, we'll actually go through and do custom motor retrofits and work to help a customer become much more efficient. As a result of spending money to help our customers not use our product, uh, we earn an incentive, which is the state structure, which has worked well for us. Um, but uh, our sales actually end up being about half a percent down each year. So the traditional model of electric utilities was that um, customer usage growth would match the CPI. So we would expect, you know, if you're uh, seeing growth in your economy, driving your CPI, you know, typically 1% to 3% was what uh, systems would grow. We went into the recession in 2008. We never came out from a sales basis. And I think there are a couple of factors. One is for the customers who, uh, whose businesses survived the recession, they were willing to make the investment in using energy efficiency, um, energy much more efficiently. And so we saw a real uptick in interest in our programs. The good news is it helped customers keep their overall bill flat because if you're using less, even if the rate's a little bit higher, you're gonna have a, a flat bill. Um, and then we saw the wave of LED lighting really moving through. So just for instance, if you're at the airport and you notice the, the parking ramp there, that used to be a good load for us. And they went through and they put in LED lights and they cut that bill by 90%. <laughs> and then they put solar on top of it. So it's really a kind of an interesting um, experiment in, in showing off. It's, been a, it's actually been a good partnership with us working with the airport to, to show off what people or customers can do with energy efficiency. And then finally, we want to keep bills low because energy is important to our businesses and our customers and their families. And so if we can make this transition but keep the prices affordable, that's really what we'd like to focus on. Um, one of the things that's helped us is the production tax credit was extended. And there was a big trade around energy issues for that. It actually allowed the export of uh, more liquefied natural gas and, and oil exports. And for that, we got an incredible extension of the production tax credit that drove the wind prices below the price of our coal. So typically coal operates in about the $23 to $28 a megawatt hour range without externalities. Um, wind priced in between $15 and $25 in the last round, and we've seen prices even cut below that on a, on a couple of projects. So that's incredible pricing. Uh, we're loading up on wind as a result. So we're, uh, we were on course to double the amount of wind we had on our system by 2030. We're, we'll actually get there by 2022. We'll have the first project uh, that takes advantage of the step down in the tax credit. So if you get the project in by 2020, you get 100% of the tax credit. If you get it in by 2021, you get 80% of the tax credit. Well, because there's this mad rush to build all the wind before 2020, you build up that uh, construction machine to put those wind turbines in and there's going to be a, a fall off and because of that fall off we actually saw continued great pricing into 2021. The tax credit drops to 60% in 2022 and we're still thinking we're going to see competitive wind prices into 2022. We do think there'll be a time where the manufacturing um, uh, of the wind turbines it takes them a couple of years to get the prices back down but the uh, the story of how the wind industry, and we're also seeing it in the solar industry, have really driven costs out of the business uh, and made uh, the, the construction of these renewable projects uh, much more cost effective is, is really amazing, and we think that will continue. Uh, this is just a map of where those wind farms are. I said earlier that we have a very politically diverse system. Um, Minnesota has been very supportive of renewable energy policy. Uh, the Dakotas, in particular in North Dakota, they mine lignite and burn it at the mine mouth. We don't buy any of that energy, but uh, those are important jobs in the North Dakota economy. And of course, then on the western side of North Dakota, they have the huge oil boom. Um, the oil boom sort of covered up this issue of, of um, uh, the, the, the loss of lignite jobs, but as the oil industry died down, there was a lot more attention on is, is wind actually taking jobs away from the coal industry. So we've really seen those arguments in North Dakota. Our response is 
to be able to show the benefits that North Dakota and South Dakota are getting from the wind projects that uh, we're installing. They create jobs, they create property taxes, um, and they are additional energy production for a state that's always been an exporter. And then, of course, along the southwest uh, part of Minnesota, we have what we call the Buffalo Ridge, which has been a natural place for a lot of wind development. There are actually older projects there now that will get rebuilt uh, with bigger and bigger turbines. So we see uh, lots of potential there. Um, I do put um, some of the opportunities which I talked about. The education here is we've had a great opportunity to tell people about the pricing. A lot of people ex have assumed that renewables were more expensive. Uh, and this lets us tell the story of uh, how cost effective those wind projects are. But there are challenges. You have to cite these projects, right? Um, obviously, avian issues are important. Proximity to neighbors is more and more important because these turbines uh, are big industrial machines, and uh, you want to get them far enough from people that they enjoy them uh, and don't find them annoying. And there's a, always a debate around how far away that is from folks. And then particularly in um, North Dakota um, and in South Dakota, we've really tried to work uh, with the tribal communities not just on lands that they own or control, but because there's a lot of their history uh, where these wind projects are going in, and we found that working with these communities helps us cite the projects better. Uh, and a lot of the vendors we use do that as well. So it's it's interesting um, opportunity for us to interact with, with those communities as well. Uh, Minnesota is a big leader in solar. You might not think about it after a couple of days of uh, glorious rainy weather here, uh, but we had a nice day Saturday. So uh, we uh, have a few large projects. That's what we call universal solar projects. Uh, there are also community solar gardens, which are one to five megawatt projects. You'll see a lot of these around the, the Twin City. We do have a little bit of net metered, which is more the rooftop solar that folks have. And then the Solar Rewards Program is also um, more of the rooftop. I think you're going to see continued interest in adding solar to the system. People love solar. There's just, it's, there's just no, no other way to say it than people love solar. It makes people feel good. Uh, they like it as uh, part of their energy mix. And I think that we had a little bit of discussion at the last legislative session about trying to get solar on all the schools in the state. I think we'll see uh, that coming back. Uh, certainly the solar that's on the convention center is uh, frequently shown in pictures of the Twin Cities. And so I think solar is something you can count on continuing to develop as part of the energy mix. The fun part about this for us is uh, we have, as I said, one of the systems with the largest amount of wind on it. We've gotten really good at integrating that wind into our system and actually forecasting the wind, which, you, you know, everybody makes the jokes about forecasting the weather. But we have a group uh, that has a pretty good idea of what the wind is going to be when we schedule our system in the day ahead market. And the accuracy of their scheduling has continued to get better and better. And the tools that they use um, allow them to just keep refining that and keep refining that. Now we'll start mixing in solar and then eventually batteries and starting to see how the three things mix together and then inter interface with the, the market. So it should be a pretty exciting time. This is where our system is from an energy mix. This is the upper Midwest system, so it's not, um, I showed you the eight state area. The, the facts on the eight state area are in the sustainability publication I have. But I'm proud of our system in the upper Midwest because we have such a great wind resource in our backyard. Uh, we are um, at about 30% renewable right now. By the time we put that uh, additional 1,800 or so megawatts of wind in by 2022, we'll be about half renewable. And then we're on a uh, path to be 60% renewable by 2030, uh, which I intend to beat by several years because there's good wind resource out there, customers like it, and we'll be able to mix solar in with that as well. So our system will be running on 85% carbon-free energy under this scenario. It's about an 80% carbon reduction from 2005 levels. Uh, that's way beyond uh, where we would have needed to go uh, as, a, as a system to do our part to meet the Paris Accord. But the good news is 
This really shows that you can get incredible amounts of renewable energy on your system and reliably operate it for your customers. We've played with how far uh, we can take that 85% number, and we've played with how far we can take the 60% number. There's a lot of debate around, can you get to 100% renewable? Our conclusion is it's gonna take some innovation and new technologies, uh, the, and there are folks at um, research institutions like the University of Minnesota and a lot of entrepreneurs working on next generation technologies. Um, and I certainly think we'll be able to get to 100% carbon free energy. Uh, whether that's 100% renewable or not probably won't matter by the time we get there. But I also think we can get there much earlier um, if we build the right policies around it. So this is, a, this is a fascinating discussion for me and it's also a fascinating policy discussion because behind these numbers are all sorts of money and investments um, in what we want to power our society. And of course that has all sorts of policy debates for legislators, politicians who were, if you're voting today, you know, you're know, you helping elect, and um, customers. Customers are more and more helping to drive this transition through the, their sustainability efforts and their drive for um, either 100% renewable energy or 100% clean energy. I'd actually um, have you take a look at a paper that Google recently published on the transition. They got to 100% renewable, but they're now breaking it down into an hour by hour. So they match their total annual load in those data centers that run all those Google searches that we like and those cat videos that we can't help but watch. Um, those things take a lot of energy, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're a great load for customers, for utilities who are losing all their customer load to efficient lighting. So everybody wants to land data centers. A lot of them have landed in Iowa. They want to be 100% renewable. So they match their total annual consumption with the total amount of renewable energy that they either caused to be on the system or that they bought from utilities or they bought renewable energy credits. They're now trying to take that to the next level and figure out how they can match hour by hour. And it's a fascinating, fairly quick read, well-written paper, it's on their website. Um, we can get the citation to you so that you've got it. And uh, uh, it really helps show the importance of not just customers moving, but what it takes to move a system to 100% uh, clean energy. Uh, this is just showing uh, the transition that we're on on a carbon reduction basis. For us, the clean energy transition is about carbon reduction. We've had the opportunity to reduce some other emissions along the way and improve our water usage as we go. Uh, but you can see it's a combination of customer efficiency, renewables, nuclear, which brings its own uh, controversy with it, which I'm happy to talk about, uh, and then coal retirements. So we had four big coal units on our system. We put closure dates on two of those units, one in 23, one in 26. There's a chance those plants might close a little bit earlier. We have two large plants left. One is uh, the King. If you ever drive across uh, the river uh, into Wisconsin, you probably see the big stack up to the north. That's the King plant. If you ever want to tour a coal plant, that's a great one to tour because it's on a beautiful national scenic river with eagles flying over the river. You can stand up on the roof of the plant and it's a beautiful view. It just happens to be a coal plant. So um, that one will go eventually and then we co-own one of the largest coal plants in the Midwest with a municipal power producer called Southern Minnesota uh, Power Agency. Uh, and that plant is up in Becker, Minnesota. So we'll eventually get the coal off the system. Uh, the debate is, is that 2030, 2040, or 2050? I have, my, I have my view and I'm happy to share that with you in Q&A. Um, but then other utilities have to get on the path to this transition too. And, uh, that's where I think the customer pressure and the policy pressure uh, will be helpful because not everybody has the opportunity or has seen the opportunity that we've seen uh, and some are, are going to need some encouragement to get there. Uh, I mentioned customer engagement. Uh, customers are excited. We're starting to see uh, electric vehicles be an issue that uh, or a, a toy. Uh, a new technology that customers are excited about. And the, the level of interest is noticeable. Um, people want to see that they can charge their vehicle. The manufacturers are figuring out how to make the mileage uh, the longer so that people don't have to worry about running out of electricity. 
Um, we're also seeing opportunities for battery storage, uh, both big and small. And there's all sorts of value streams attached to that. So there's uh, a lot of work going on there. There's also some environmental issues with uh, the things that go into batteries and what happens to batteries at the end of their life. Um, I think those can get worked through, but they need to be on the list to get worked through. And then rooftop solar, uh, which has uh, both pros and, and cons um, on the pricing side. So you get some really good pricing debates when you, you get into the rooftop uh, solar issues. And then stakeholder engagement is we found to be really critical. So we're a company that provides service to all the customers in the, in the Twin Cities and and across the, the states that I've talked about. We found one of the things that's helpful is to get out and tell our story, but also to uh, engage with policymakers, with our host communities that host these large plants, um, and then uh, make sure that we're talking to people whose jobs or livelihoods are gonna be impacted. So we use a lot of labor in our plants. Uh, they care about feeding their families and supporting their communities, so that's a critical audience for us. And then we also have, um, obviously, customer groups that are, that are interested at different levels. Um, this is a picture of our Prairie Island nuclear plant down near Red Wing. If you've never taken a tour of a nuclear plant, I would highly recommend it. It's a very interesting. You'll have a real appreciation for safety and security because uh, you can't walk around the plant uh, without noticing those two things. Uh, but this plant also has the privilege of um, being uh, right next to the Prairie Island Indian community. And we store nuclear spent fuel that the federal government was supposed to pick up 20 years ago, um, about 600 yards from that community. Uh, and those are the kinds of tribal and community interests that um, necessarily become part of what we think about uh, when we work on sustainability and what's our long-term energy future issues. Uh, I can talk for about three hours on nuclear spent fuel if you want to push that button. Um, but suffice it to say, the original compact with the federal government was that that fuel was to go to a central repository. And the federal government's 20 years late in picking the fuel up. Uh, there are some proposals to both restart the work around Yucca Mountain, but also for some consolidated interim storage places that will make more sense. And when you look at the growing number of sites around the US, California has nuclear spent fuel sitting basically on the beach. Uh, so that's gonna motivate our California elected officials to wanna deal with it. Uh, Vermont has uh, spent fuel that they'd like moved. Uh, so we do see some hope that consolidated and storage will be viewed as a, um, a more realistic and quite frankly, a better approach to handling this issue. Uh, and if nothing else, um, the Europeans move this stuff every day. And, you know, so we can look to our friends in Europe like we look to for a lot of renewable energy and policy uh, and learn from them as well. Okay, that's enough of my nuclear rant. <laughs> All right, I wanted to just touch a little bit on the culture of sustainability. As I mentioned before, um, our CEOs have really driven uh, those three priorities and this transition. They've made it very comfortable for folks to debate how fast we make this transition and the things we can do to make the transition. Uh, we recently had a uh, debate internally um, about what's the best path, just keep charging ahead like we're doing, pursue a state carbon reduction incentive, or pursue a carbon tax. And we had people uh, all over the, all over the uh, debate and uh, it was a healthy discussion for us. Uh, we also work to tell our story with our customers, so occasionally you'll see our ads. A lot of our ads are really focused around delivering the energy efficiency uh, message. Uh, but we really try to drive that. We're on a transition. We're embracing this transition. You'll see pictures of renewable energy up all over our place, and then a couple of pictures that I made and put up of, of nuclear plants, and then a couple of pictures of coal plants. So, you know, we, sh we try to show you the whole mix. Uh, and then I'm can get cynical. So for those of you who've spent time interning or working at a corporation, a lot of times you'll see the mission and the vision and the value statement. And our CEO has actually tried to make these much more relevant, things that people can remember, things that are around the core of our safety uh, and our connection to our communities, uh, our commitment to making this transition and having people trust what we say. Um, so these have actually been helpful as we make that, that journey. 
Um, and I just like to, to share, these things can be things that get written down and put on the website and nobody reads and nobody can remember, or they can be things that actually help. And we've been very uh, um, intentional about trying to make these uh, things that help uh, drive the, the conversation forward. And then finally, you can have a little fun with it too, because it's always good to have fun. And one of the things that we like having fun with is bees and butterflies. Uh, because we have a lot of landscape that lends itself to pollinators and we all need to help our pollinators because um, a lot of the chemicals used in the ag industry uh, have taken a real toll on particularly the monarch and we've also seen a lot of uh, turmoil in the bee population. And so there are pollinator bombs back at the table if you want to take one home next spring you can throw those in probably in your yard not on the campus. So. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and grow uh, um, uh, species that the, the pollinators like. So we do this all around our system. Uh, we do it under transmission lines quite a bit. Uh, we uh, also find doing it under solar installations to be a very natural fit. Uh, and, and again, um, lets kids go get their hands dirty and it's pretty fun. So with that, I voted today. I hope you all made time to vote today and I'd be happy to uh, answer questions and uh, share any other thoughts that would be interesting to you. And if anybody needs a, uh, oh, thanks. All right, since it's political season, I did bring an 11 point plan. If there are no questions, I'm gonna go over the 11 point plan. <laughs> we'll make sure we have plenty of questions. Um, actually, just to, to kind of get the room warmed up a bit, I'd like to also introduce um, our director of the Institute on the Environment, um, Jessica Hellman. Who would I hope that, that you could be joined up here? And um, you have a microphone already. You're good to go. Can you turn it on? Fantastic. Um, and this way, then we can uh, get the conversation started. So thank you, Jessica, for doing that. Going right, Justin? Great. All right, I took a lot of notes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks, everybody, and thank you so much, Chris, for being here. So the way this will go down is I would like to ask you a few things so that everyone can listen in, and then we'll open it up for, I'm sure this group has a bunch of questions Sounds for good. You. Sounds good. Um, it's always really energizing to um, hear you um, and other sort of industry leaders talk about some of these ideas, partly because of the statistics you show, but a lot of it is to see your excitement and enthusiasm about the future. And you said it's interesting and there can be uh, important debates about 100% renewable, but you seem pretty darn comfortable putting a pie chart up there that talks about 80% renewable. I wonder if you might share with us a little bit about your own journey or, or sure. how the last several years have been for you and how you get to this point where you feel, ex you seem excited. How yeah, we, we are excited, we are excited. In, in your line of work and, and you personally. Sure, absolutely. So. Uh, one of the things that our industry has a reputation for is being very conservative, and that's really driven by a responsibility to make sure that we're providing reliable power, we're providing affordable power, and that we're doing it safely. It's also a very complex system. Uh, you can go back to the uh, blackout days of, uh, and, then, and watch the formation over history of a more integrated grid, which is really designed to make sure that Utilities can rely on each other uh, when there's an event um, and, and make sure that that machine is keeping the lights on as much as we can. Even things like storm response, we work on staging crews ahead of storms now and trying to get the lights back on faster and faster for customers because people just have no patience in the days of uh, gadgets and interconnected things to, to be out. In the past, people would see a storm go through and they'd be okay with a day or two. Uh, now we're in the six hour range and if you pass six hours people are, are frustrated and we can actually track the, the anger volume on the, on, the, on the 800 line or fortunately now we get the texts and, and other things. So that conservative culture is, a, is embedded in, in a lot of what we built for the system and I think when the first debates about wind came along there were concerns that because of the variable nature of wind could only get about 10 percent and then the system might start breaking. Well, over time, the engineers have gotten much more comfortable. And so we're now getting into the 60, 70. Um, occasionally, we'll see times where the wind penetration hits 80% levels. And uh, the engineers are figuring out how to run the system that way, how to plan for the system that way, and make it more resilient and robust. So we feel more and more confident about what we can do. 
But there's still a debate that rages in the industry about pulling all the big machines off, the very big central power stations. And these are big machines. And a lot of times I encourage people to go um, at least drive by the power plant and get a, 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 an understanding of the scale and scope of what we're talking about because um, there's a lot of energy coming out of those things and moving through those big transmission lines. And what we're getting more comfortable with is you can put a lot of wind on the system, you can put a lot of solar on it, and the interconnected nature is helping us out. The current debate now is, okay, Excel, you can clean up your system, but our neighbors up at Minnesota Power in Duluth or out in, uh, uh, in North Dakota with their Coal Creek station might be having to back us up. And, of course, that Coal Creek station um, is actually bringing generation in across a DC line and dumping it around in the... Um, basically the exurbs around the Twin Cities, that's the, the Great River Energy. So we're all trying to figure out, okay, what's the, the order of taking these last coal plants out? There are engineers spending a lot of time on this, uh, but one of the things we've gotten much more comfortable with is the economics are going to help us. We've seen tremendous price declines over the last 10 years. We couldn't have predicted it. Fracking is huge on the natural gas side, but the renewable industry has basically kept up bringing their cost curve down uh, and that, that's a, a fascinating study in and of itself. And then we're also seeing new technologies and innovation that are on the, on the edge that are going to help us run the grid more ef efficiently and effectively and with more distributed generation resources on it. Now, that introduces one more thing to worry about. I mentioned our conservative nature. Cybersecurity and physical security uh, keep uh, several folks... Um, thinking about how do they make sure that we're, we're locking up the things we need to lock up. Um, but we're pretty confident that it can be done. You won't do it as one company, but we can do it as an industry. Uh, and sometime, at some points, the distributed nature of, of some of the things will actually help provide the natural resilience as well. It's a long explanation, but it's, it's really been a journey that we're on. For me, uh, personally, helping make this transition, I, I can see the excitement of our customers and communities. Uh, we can actually see that ele the electric sector has reduced its carbon, and now we've handed the carbon uh, title over to the transportation sector, who I think was really struggling with how they're going to do it. But fortunately, my load's all going away, so I need to go get some new load, and I'm going to go after transportation. And I think, I think um, the environmental story around transportation is positive. But the other thing is those vehicles are actually pretty fun to drive. So if you ever get a chance to drive or ride in your friend's Tesla? That's pretty cool. Uh, you'll enjoy it. Uh, but also, um, even the more mundane uh, Nissan Leaf yeah. or the Chevy Volt, our, our employees that drive those love them and, and just can't stop talking about them. That was actually going to be my second question, is what you think about electrification. So when we talk about getting carbon out of other sectors, we say we're going to elect one idea is to electrify everything. So if you work for an electric utility, how do you feel about that? I feel really good about that. <laughs> <laughs> I mentioned we have a tricky business model earlier. This is on the helpful column of, of that side. Uh, I feel also really good about it because if you operate your vehicle um, running off electricity on our system, I showed you we're about 50% carbon free right now. We'll be about 60%. Um, carbon uh, free in 22. We're going to get to 85% carbon free pretty quickly. That's a much better profile than if you're filling up at the pump. It's also cheaper and the cars have uh, less repair. There are some you know, auto industry um, places where they're playing catch up and I think we'll really start to see the, the technology get better and better. Uh, and I'm really excited about also electrifying um, not just cars that people drive individually, but creating links to a more sensible transportation system that actually builds together the autonomous vehicles that we're seeing and the, um, the transit systems we have that can be taken to the next level. So there's experiments basically now on uh, metro buses. I think we'll have about six in the metro area that'll be electric. And I think school buses are a big uh, place. If I could go to the legislature and inter introduce a bill to electrify all the school buses, I think I could build some support for that. Because we've all sat behind the bus at the stop sign when it, they hit the gas and that big puff of diesel smoke comes out. And I, I just think there's a lot of natural places where um, we're having emissions in our urban environment and we're not thinking about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a chance to really change uh, that, uh, that profile and, and quality of life for us all. We 
um, in my household, we have an electric vehicle. We have also a non-electric vehicle. And I always say that the electric car, it, it turns <coughs> out in our household to be more popular because we argue about who's going to take the gas car <laughs> to the gas station. I say, I'm not going to the gas station. You go to the gas station. Nobody likes selling out. <laughs> Um, so I want to talk about getting to that 100%, and then I'd like to open it up for questions. But getting, hypothetically, if we had 100% renewable, or we, we eliminated a fossil base, as, at least as much as possible, out of our electricity generation, one of the things that we'd have to figure out is how to address this peak demand of power, right? So right. All, the way the p electricity system works is we all have a, many of us have a sort of common life cycle and we go home or there are hot parts of the day or, um, and we demand power at uneven, uh, in uneven amounts through the day. And I know this is a very active part of debate and discussion about how to manage those peaks. So would you talk a little bit about what do you think about um, whether it's demand pricing or battery technology or all of the above, what, what do you think about how we manage these the days when we demand the most power. Um. Well, it's a really, it's a, it's a really interesting um, equation because we tend not to store energy uh, very much. It's mostly a make it and use it. Uh, there is a little bit of storage, um, and actually, storage people I think about think about batteries quite a bit because that's the, kind of the new technology. You see the power wall, um, you see the industrial battery installations that I showed in the slide. Uh, but we also have a neighbor to the north in Manitoba, uh, in Manitoba called Manitoba Hydro that actually uh, operates a giant hydro system. Uh, and they argue that their system can be converted to operate as a giant storage system. Um, in other places, they use pumped water storage systems. Uh, all those bring their own sets of controversies with them. Um, but over the long run, this is one of the places where I see uh, technology, innovation, and big data really changing our world. Um, I think the pricing is interesting, but I think it's pricing. Um, I am in the camp that it's more pricing for utilities and, and large industrial users that for the end consumers. Um, when you do pricing experiments, you tend to see them fall off after about two months. Mm. Um, oh, I moved my load around in my house, and yeah, that was fun, but now I'm going to go back to my life. So, could somebody else please do this for us? And I think. There are opportunities with technologies for us to step in and do that behind the scenes so that customers continue to experience the comfort that they want and the convenience they want. Uh, but we're moving their air conditioner around knowing that their neighbors is off. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do that with air conditioners now, but I think there's a whole range of additional appliances. And then I also think that in-home uh, storage devices will give us some opportunities as well. And then as you start putting more rooftop solar in the mix, uh, the whole equation is just going to keep changing on us. So it's going to keep us on our toes. Um, but I think uh, there are a lot of opportunities there. Now, I'm in one camp. There are others who are in the camp of wanting to enable uh, end-use customers to be able to go online and, and trade power, trade power that they generate themselves. And um, we have a great trading floor. If that's the field you're interested in, uh, you know, uh, you can see it. There are places where it's gone all, all the way there. When I look at the retail competition markets, I'm not convinced that it helps us actually get to the goal of wiping out the, the carbon on our system. So for me, when I look at the system, it's how do I chase the most carbon out of the system the fastest? And at what point do I jump over, because it's economically most efficient, to helping my friends in the transportation industry decarbonize or reduce the carbon uh, of their industry? And then... I'm actually a believer that the agricultural industry will be easier than most people think because I think there we can drive some economics into it. Uh, industrial uses are probably one of the trickier ones. But this, this, is, this is why I find this all so exciting. I mean, there's just layer after layer of innovation and um, opportunity coming for smart University of Minnesota students and, <laughs> yeah, and faculty. So what would you say for our students and researchers? If you were like if you were maybe embarking on your career again, or if you were looking across your company or some of the industries that you're working with, what do you think is fun and exciting and going to so, be really impactful? So for the, the, the STEM crowd that uh, is really good at um, 
either pure research or applied research and innovation, I think the opportunities are tremendous. For the entrepreneurs who want to explore moving um, products and ideas to market, I think the opportunities are tremendous. And even for history and poli-sci majors who went to law school, <laughs> there are opportunities <laughs> in this. So uh, the, the policy effort around this, the, the telling the story or helping customers uh, is tremendous. And then I'm um, actually thinking through how do we make the sensible transitions and where are those opportunities to interact with uh, with players. You take autonomous vehicles, for instance. A lot of folks assume that those will be electrified. Um, that can go down one path of really helping us to build on our transit systems uh, and have a much more uh, pleasant experience as we commute in and out of our jobs and, and our communities. Or it could go the other way and be a complete disaster. So I think all across the spectrum, there will be challenges and opportunities that keep getting uh, created. And I know throughout our, our company, I'm always amazed at the, the different things people are working on from the basics of the things that I focus my time on and how are we making this fleet transition uh, to the folks who are driving the technology into the workforce. When we first gave out the tablets to the crews, uh, it was very much like most technology, technology adoptions. Employees were not really sure about it. They found it a little clunky. We couldn't get those tablets out of our crew's hands now because it's helped them be more productive and efficient in their job. And we're really watching uh, jobs that were very physically intense have the opportunity to shift to uh, technology-assisted jobs. And it, so it's a, just all across the spectrum, tremendous opportunity. So what you're passionate in, what you're interested in doing, uh, you can find great connections into, into opportunities in the workforce. Any questions, guys? Are you I'm going to go ahead and run, run things around so that. Uh, yeah, you need to speak in there so that folks online can hear you. Thank sure. you. Uh, so, you talked a little bit about um, engaging all of your stakeholders, including policymakers, as well as kind of the internal debate at Excel about some policies and ways to move forward. Sure. So I was wondering if you could talk about some specific policies that Excel is looking either to pursue or support in the upcoming legislative session. Uh, we, we, we're kind of waiting for the results of today uh, <laughs> to decide um, exactly where we want to go. Uh, but, but since you asked, uh, <laughs> I do have an 11 point plan. So uh, candidate Walls uh, was at a, an event that I attended where he said that he wants to make sure to pull people around the table to have a consensus effort to build a, a 10 point plan. And then we've also reached out uh, to the other candidate and talk to him about energy policies. But I didn't want to show up without anything. So I figured if I come in with 11, maybe I'll come out with a few things. But I think we have an opportunity to have the discussion at the legislature um, about how do we want to chase this 85% um, by 2030, uh, or maybe even more aggressively. And I think we have opportunities to also talk about things like, um, do we want to uh, work together to try to electrify transportation uh, and I think we also then have some of the places where we want to experiment on our system uh, and I think we have opportunities around that I mentioned that there was some discussion about solar on schools um, I see that one coming back it's just a, it's like um, it's like the pollinators it's a very happy thing thinking of going up to your school uh, and having solar there and if we can put a pollinator field there too perfect so I, I see a lot of opportunities there I, I, I do think it's fair to mention that you know, I talk about this transition, but the, the transition has required uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, and we have hundreds of millions of dollars uh, still depreciating on these assets. So I have about $750 million uh, left to depreciate on the coal plants, and I've got over a billion dollars to depreciate on my carbon-free nuclear plants. Um, I have nuclear spent fuel stored at both sites, that I'm going to go to D.C. again here and tell them they need to take someplace else. And so there's a lot of those issues that, that really um, lend themselves to discussions. And a couple of other things. Uh, last year, the Prairie Island Indian community was interested in pursuing legislation uh, to be the first uh, community uh, that's net zero. 
and uh, that's a pretty fun project. We actually don't serve them even though we have a nuclear plant right next to them. They're served by Dakota Electric, which is a great river energy utility. Uh, so we'd really need to work in partnership with the community, Dakota Electric, GRE, and others. But I think there's some fun opportunities there. And I would like to see the state put a marker out and pick some things like school buses to try to electrify the entire fleet across the state. California had some fascinating legislation to get to 100% clean energy by 2045. In Minnesota, we like to deconstruct things and make them our own. Um, we don't like to do what California did. We like to do it better than they did. So we like to take their good ideas and deconstruct them and, and make them uh, Minnesota's, and I think there are some opportunities there. So we'll see what the election holds, but like I said before, kind of regardless of the outcome, I see opportunities. I see an opportunity to see what others are interested in trying to accomplish. And, and go up to the legislature and, and work together to see what we can put together. Hi, I've got a question about um, the, the connection that you see between the, the transmission lines and the distribution uh, system. I mean, one of the things that you have is you have a, a completely vertically integrated company. And uh, as there are more renewables and as you talk about uh, um, building out distributed generation more is at the level of the distribution grid. Right. So uh, how, how do you envision that change? And how, d how does that play in with what the other utilities are doing in Minnesota? Because you know, obviously, Minnesota is a big state. You know, right. Excel has the most customers. And you lead by example. They are also positioning themselves. And in answering your question, please define vertically integrated. Okay. So vertically integrated in our industry is generally meant to mean we have the big generating assets, the large transmission wires that move the power from those big uh, generators to the communities, and then when we get to your community, you've got the, the poles and wires uh, that if they're above ground, you see in your neighborhood. And there's substations in between those that help transform the, the voltages in that power, basically stepping it up at the generator and then stepping it back down. Um, you step the voltage up because moving it at higher voltage lets us move more across long distances. What GRE does, moving it across a DC line, or Manitoba does that on its system, allows you to do even more movement of that power with, with lower line losses. As you move to a more decentralized or a mixed system, I actually think you want a robust investment in both. Fortunately, we made a strong investment in transmission here in the Midwest, and we did it by putting together a coalition of investor-owned utilities like us, and co-ops, uh, which are uh, not profit companies, they're member-owned companies, uh, and we actually invested significantly in the transmission system. That has allowed us to make this uh, tremendous wind investment that we're making and get a lot of this wind energy uh, to our communities. I think as we take some of the big coal units out, we're going to want to strengthen some pieces of that large transmission system. But we're also now working through what we want to do on the distribution system to make it easier for people to connect if they want to put rooftop solar in or if a community wants to put a solar garden in. How can you make that connection process easier? How can you make the uh, system work with the two-way power flows? Uh, where do we want to change transformer sizings and those types of things? And then we also will eventually have information moving. Um, which can either move over the electric wires or is going to move over fiber accompanying the electric system. So I think, I think there's a tremendous build-out on the distribution system that's coming. Uh, I think we have time to do that, but I think we need to be paying attention to it. I also advocate for continuing to strengthen some of uh, the large transmission system because I see uh, potential to add significantly more wind in western Minnesota and the Dakotas and move that, and we, we basically will hit a constraint in the middle of Wisconsin. And if we can push through that constraint, uh, we can start moving some of our wind energy into the Chicago market and help them, because uh, they need help, because you know we're here to help. And our friends up in, in uh, Duluth, um, I think they certainly know that we move a lot of power north and south, so we have a nice diversity exchange with Canada, and so I think there are opportunities to make sure we're keeping um, that pathway strong and robust as well. So I'll take, uh, I'll take as much wires as I can get as, a, as your utility guy. <laughs> While I ha hand this off, can I ask a quick follow-up sure. question there? Um, 
So as you look at this idea of, of increased um, decentralization on the grid, could you also speak to some of the pricing aspects? So there has been, in terms of rate structure, you talked a little bit about residential versus industrial commercial um, price structures, but there's been some uh, interest, I guess, or at least some discussion around this idea that perhaps a new utility model around pricing for reliability might be a bigger part of the, the business model than the pricing for bulk power, um, whether that's in regulatory markets or other, other things. Those have been places where some of these new technologies have found inroads. I'm just wondering what that might mean for a utility. Uh, I think there are opportunities to, to take a look at that. I think that uh, certainly in Europe we've seen some experimentation with that. Uh, and then there have been what I would call smaller experiments in, in the U.S. on that front. Um, I'm a, I guess I, I would put myself in the camp of I think the most energy intensive users are the most likely uh, to take us up on, on moving to those sort of market models. Uh, what we found with our commercial customers is they're more focused on whatever their core business is and they would rather us, uh, rather than presenting them pricing options, present uh, power quality options for them. So I, I guess I would say take a look at some of the German experiments on this front. I think those are informative. You can take a look at some of the models that have been tried in, in Texas. I get concerned that there's a breakage from what we're trying to accomplish on the policy level versus where we go on the markets. Now, having said that, I will say that the utilities joining a market structure brought tremendous value for our customers. So I don't rule out that if we can make this simpler and easier for folks that there are ways to uh, advance that paradigm. I just think we have to be careful um, where we're creating confusion or complexities for customers versus where we're just making progress on, on, on the other goals that we have for our system. But for those who are really into pricing, there's the, you can, there are all sorts of models uh, to take a look at. Um, you know, Europe and Canada have, have tried the performance-based rate making. Uh, we've got some experiments around that here too, so. Knock yourself out if you're into the pricing. <laughs> Ellen? Yeah, thanks. So, Chris, th and thank you for your leadership. Um, way back in 1994, as you know, we had a big debate in the Minnesota legislature about the future of nuclear power. And one of the um, results of that debate was a fund that was created called the Renewable Development Fund, now the Renewable Development Account. And it's had a long and um, varied history of usage, all that money, and I'm not sure that Excel has been totally thrilled with all of that. That's, um, that's fair. Nor have I, <laughs> uh, personally. Um, but my question is, maybe in your list of what's next, or maybe in our next legislative round, is there a possibility of trying to come together on, on a new vision for that? Because I don't know if Excel thinks wants it to go away, I hope not, but I think that there's an opportunity there to use that funding in a way that helps you meet some of these big, big goals that you're talking about and to do it in a way that the people of Minnesota would really love to see happen. So using funding not just for the cutting edge research that we need to continue to make sure we're finding those answers, uh, technology answers, but also um, to do some of these big demonstrations across the state, like helping some communities go to net zero. Mm -hmm. um, and that was kind of the plan with the RDF last year, I guess. Or helping build microgrids in communities, or helping to retrofit school buses or buy new school buses. I mean, things that could be really visible signs and symbols of our energy evolution revolution that we're undergoing. I think that would be a really great use of those dollars. So I'm just wondering what you might think. In your answer, can you explain a little background what the renewal, what sure. the RDF is yeah. and where it comes from? To Ellen's point, back in 1994, part of the legislation, I actually, uh, I'd have to go through the whole history, but essentially where we are now today is for every cask of nuclear spent fuel that we load, the ones at Prairie Island, we pay $500,000 a year to the renewable development account. The ones at Monticello, uh, we pay $350,000 a year. 
Uh, that money is in a fund. Just to give you a perspective of number of casts and what we're talking about here, our customers will pay about $40 million uh, into that fund next year. Uh, so that's a lot of money on an annual basis. Um, and again, to Ellen's point, the, the legislature has put their finger on how we've spent that money on occasion. On the good side, some of it went to the University of Minnesota. Um, but there are examples where maybe it wasn't the, the best use of, of funds. I think there is an opportunity to explore that. Um, we are also interested in the discussion to um, maybe expand that a little bit. In Colorado, we use a method where all customers pay into a renewable energy standards account, and that's worked as a vehicle to be able to facilitate some of those things. And I think there's an opportunity uh, for customers in Duluth and com customers in the exurbs around the Twin Cities um, perhaps to pay into it. I wouldn't mind switching it from nuclear to coal. That might start to resemble a carbon tax, and that would, and can't say that word at the legislature. At least you couldn't. We'll see what we have um, post-election. So I think there are, to your point, opportunities to explore how you can use opportunities to uh, make uh, good demonstration projects and, and make interesting transitions on the system. Uh, we would like to be out of the category of being the only utility who does it because we think there is actually a, a responsibility of all the utility community to take a look at how we make this transition. I thought we had one question yeah, over here that talk, I... Chris Toff had one. One more question. You better be a good one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. So my question kind of gets back to the transmission system and under your bullet point eight, explore regional solutions, transmission need, MISO analysis. I'm just curious, you know, a lot of the northern states have different policy goals than some of the southern states yes. and other states within MISO and how you sort of see Excel's role in MISO's evolution and advancement and how that uh, market is going to play out. So you and get sure you get extra points MISO. for uh, for for citing MISO yeah. Midwest Independent System Operator. Uh, so there are regional transmission operators around the U.S. Ours in the Midwest is the Midwest Independent System Operator, who coordinate the flows across that bulk transmission system, uh, and then also help us as we're connecting new wind projects to the system and identifying <coughs> where new transmission needs to be built. And I think the debate that's coming in our industry is, as I look at closing the, the last of our two coal plants, and Minnesota Power, based in Duluth, looks at what's the future of its Boswell plant, and as Great River Energy looks at what's the future of its Coal Creek plant, and even my friends at MidAmerican look at their coal plants, um, MISO is going to struggle with who's closing what and how do we study to know that the system's gonna maintain that reliability that we want. And I think the opportunity is, like we did in building uh, transmission where we got a bunch of the utilities together, is actually to get a lot of the generators together and work with MISO to map out what a closure pattern could look like. Let them study one pattern and let's decide what sort of investment would make sense. We're all sitting in our corporate walls thinking about what date could I close this I mentioned the remaining life depreciation that sits out there. We all have that. We're all trying to figure out um, how do we make the transition go as fast as our customers want, but how do we deal with making sure that uh, we have the reliable integ reliability integrity that we need and the financial integrity that we need. And I think there's an opportunity for some cooperation uh, like we've had in the past where Minnesota's been a leader on figuring out how to get this done. And I think that is something we could contribute to the national model to really help encourage the transition. Because one utility can do so much, uh, but then you'll always hit the argument of, well, now you're leaning on my system, or now you're leaning on the neighboring state. And I think MISO's in a position to help coordinate some of this analysis, uh, but I also think the utilities and others can get together uh, and encourage that cooperation and, and in some ways create a, uh, you know, there's always a debate around this too, because your transmission people will tell you, build another transmission line. Your energy efficiency people will tell you, do more energy efficiency. Your power plant folks will say, build another power plant. I'd like a big gas plant there. Now that's uh, you know, another point of the, of the controversy. Your nuclear folks would say, don't close the sister plant to Monticello. 
in, outside of Cedar Rapids, Iowa, go close a coal plant instead. So I think actually having some coordination would at least get us to figure out what's a sensible way to close these plants, what's a sensible way to, to do these transitions, and either on a state basis we could address some of the additional issues too, like how do we take care of the host communities, uh, what's the property tax base change, and there are layers and layers <coughs> that get in there. But that, that's really what I'm, I'm chasing with that. I, I do think there's some core, I'm reminded every once in a while by those engineers that the physics matter, so I, I like to take them seriously on that, and you know, because I'd say things like, well, let's just turn them all off in 2021. <laughs> like, we don't know what would happen. I'm like, well, let's study that then. So that's some of the work that I think needs to be done, and I think we've got a great history in Minnesota of, of bringing people together to do that, and I think that would be very healthy. And I also then think it's something that we could call up California and say, hey, you have all those goals and you don't know how you're going to meet them. We're already ahead of you, so here, here's our playbook. <laughs> that's just friendly. That's, that's what I mean by that. Fantastic. Jessica, do you have any final parting thoughts from EVs to pollinators? No, my, my parting thought would be, yeah, let's go show California how to get it done. <laughs> I think that sounds really exciting. And the economic opportunity that lies in the state of Minnesota and the cool things there are to be figured out, that really gets us excited, of course, here at the university. So, uh, no, I, just to thank you. Thank you so well, much, Chris, for being Thank you all for listening and uh, giving me the opportunity. <laughs>